So today we're going to be exploring something called the Voynich Manuscript. So this was a manuscript discovered in 1912, and the mystery behind it is that it's written in seemingly an unknown language, with drawings, illustrations, and uh, paintings of plants and figures that don't really exist. Uh, nobody's seen these letters before, or this language. Um, nobody's heard of it. Uh, and the drawings inside the manuscript are of plants, mainly, um, as well as astrological things uh, that people have never seen before. Nobody's seen them, uh, nobody's read about them in other documents, so it is kind of strange. There are a lot of strange details in this one, so without further ado, let's explore the Voynich Manuscript. So where did this manuscript come from, and how far can we trace it back? Well, the modern story starts in 1912, when an American-Polish rare books collector called Wilfried Voynich discovered and purchased the manuscript from the Jesuit college. Uh, you can imagine it like this ancient rare book sale or something. So he bought this book because he was so fascinated by everything inside of it. It was so strange and unusual, the things inside of it. And he actually spent the rest of his life trying and failing to decode everything in it. Uh, when Voynich died, a guy called H.P. Krauss ended up buying the manuscript from his estate. Uh, and then later on, he donated it to the Beinecke Library, where it remains today. So, within this manuscript are over 200 pages, uh, some of which fold out three or four times. Uh, filled with notes and drawings and words and sentences uh, and letters Individual little symbols that don't even make sense. Uh, the letters don't exist in any language We know today or any language we have ever known the word and sentence structure has been analyzed with Advanced computers as we have nowadays and it doesn't line up with any known language structure the drawings are often of plants and astrological structures or figures, um, but they don't really line up with reality either. The plants in the book look kind of alien. Um, I, mean, I mean, they look like plants, but they don't actually connect or line up or match up with plants that we actually know exist. And the other drawings are seemingly of kind of fantasy situations, you know, like people dancing around and looking through tubes and stuff. So nothing in this book really makes sense. So, of course, as humans, we have been trying to figure it out ever since it's been discovered. So before we get into tracing this book back uh, and trying to figure out the path that it took over the years, I should say that before the internet, obviously, um, before the printing press, before modern science, uh, a lot of these mysterious items and objects were hard to determine whether they were real or not. If they had an alert of kind of magic, mystery, uh, ancient lost civilizations, languages, that sort of thing, um, they were often regarded quite highly among people who were sort of into that thing. Uh, you weren't able to carbon copy things, you weren't able to Google search it or, you know, that sort of thing. So if something kind of mysterious came up, uh, as long as you could get people to believe that it was real, um, it often kind of was taken as real. Uh, and this was something that a guy called Rudolf II, who was the emperor of Germany at the time, um, was quite fond of. He was known for spending large amounts of money on mysterious, magical things. Uh, little trinkets or stuff for his collection. Anything that was rare or mysterious, uh, he was willing normally to pay a fair amount of money for. Um, so this is where we start the tracking, essentially, of the uh, of the manuscript. So we know that Rudolf II bought the manuscript for 600 gold ducats. Uh, now a gold ducat was a gold coin, essentially. And um, 600 gold ducats in today's money would be somewhere around 90,000 US dollars, which is, um, that's, a, that's, that's quite a bit. So it is believed, 
that he bought the manuscript from a guy called John D. Also, forgive me if we go through a lot of names and it's kind of confusing because there are quite a few names in this whole uh, in this whole story. So hopefully we can all follow along. So John Dee was a mathematician, astronomer. Uh, he was an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I of England and at the time owned one of the largest libraries in England, which kind of explains how he might have a manuscript like this. And that's basically as far back as we can reliably trace it. Who or where John D got the manuscript from is basically the start of any theory that people might have. Uh, so Rudolf II, the emperor, believed that the manuscript was the work of someone called Roger Bacon, who was a 13th century English philosopher and kind of scientist. Uh, this is because John Dee, at the time, uh, also owned a bunch of manuscripts from Roger Bacon alongside the Voynich manuscript. Um, so Rudolf essentially you know, kind of tried to put two and two together, uh, figured this was some mysterious ancient work of, um, of Roger Bacon and paid a lot of money for it. Um, so who is Roger Bacon? So Roger Bacon is kind of a cool dude, kind of a, kind of a weird dude uh, when you look into him. Uh, he was kind of a medieval witch doctor, kind of miracle healer sort of thing. Kind of a mad scientist whose uh, methods often got him in trouble, uh, sometimes got him even jailed. But one of the things he was known for is his experiments with light and glass. Um, so he would often experiment with the reflection of light through glass, the refraction of light. He was sometimes known to explore methods or theories about fixing people's eyesight through different uh, types of glass, through lenses, that sort of thing. So one theory says that a bunch of the drawings in the manuscript are representations of a view that you would get when looking through a microscope at certain plant matter or living material, that sort of thing, which is fine. But the strange thing is that the microscope wasn't invented really until the 1600s. So if this were true, then Roger Bacon would be hundreds of years ahead of his time, which the theory goes would explain maybe uh, why he was so secretive and having to write everything, uh, you know, encoded and using different kind of images instead of one-to-one -one images of what he was actually seeing as a way of staying out of trouble and staying out of jail and keeping his discoveries secret in a way, uh, which I'm sure a theory like this or thought process like this is one of the things, one of the reasons why Rudolf uh, was happy to pay so much money for the manuscript. Um, that's one theory. So another theory says that the author of the manuscript is a guy called Edward Kelly. Uh, so again, lots of names, I, I apologize, but um, Edward Kelly, who is Edward Kelly? So he was an English scribe, honestly a bit of a charlatan, bit of a scam artist sort of thing. Um, much of his early years are relatively unknown, um, but he was convicted of uh, forgery when he was younger, and as a result had his ears clipped, uh, which was a fairly common punishment at the time. So often to hide his ears being clipped, maybe he was embarrassed about them, maybe he didn't want people thinking uh, that he was, he was a charlatan, so um, in order to hide the punishment, he would often wear his hair long uh, over his non-existent ears, or half-existent. Uh, he would wear hats as well. Um, he would basically cover it up, which is, uh, it's understandable. So Edward Kelly, bit of a charlatan, bit of a scam artist. He worked actually very closely with John Dee who, if you remember from the start of the video, he was the guy that uh, Rudolf probably bought the manuscript of. So John Dee and Edward Kelly uh, often traveled Europe 
together quite extensively. Uh, they knew each other quite well, and they would often try and convince uh, rich, powerful people of certain abilities or powers or insights that they had. Uh, so John D was convinced, I don't know how much it was John D being naive or Edward Kelly being very convincing, uh, but Kelly was kind of known as being a scryer, uh, an alchemist, turning base metals into gold sort of thing, which is you know, it's kind of cool but crazy, of talking to angels, which is interesting because we'll come back to that in a second, um, and talking into crystal balls and mirrors and that sort of thing. Um, so the interesting thing about the talking to angels bit is Kelly was apparently the only one who could understand the angels. So, of course, you needed him in order to translate what the angels were saying uh, and to map it into regular language. So he said that they spoke a language called angelic, which is probably quite fitting, but he would often use made-up symbols that he made up um, in order to help him map and translate what the angels were saying. Um, so they eventually did part ways, and the <laughs> the uh, the reason for that was quite funny. Um, so Kelly convinced D that the angels were telling them that they had to share everything, which seems nice, but he meant everything, uh, which included John D's wife, uh, which I'm sure you can maybe guess at what sharing means in that context. Um, so it wasn't long after this that Dee ended up, uh, you know, parting ways with Kelly. Uh, not before sharing his wife, however, which is like, all right, I mean, maybe you'd want to part ways before that, but, you know, I don't know. Um, so Kelly would later go on to kind of continue his old ways, uh, came back to England for a bit, uh, traveled around Europe for a bit more, trying to convince rich and powerful people that he was an alchemist and he was able to transmute metals into gold. This got him imprisoned a few more times after he wasn't able to do what he said uh, and he ended up dying in prison because he was locked up because he couldn't he couldn't do what he said uh, and he tried to escape the prison uh, from the stories that I've read ended up falling uh, breaking his leg and in medieval times, that was probably a death sentence. It's a shame he couldn't transmute broken legs into regular legs, you know. Uh, so that's two theories so far. We have one of Roger Bacon, uh, the quirky science guy who created this whole manuscript in order to disguise his advanced work and discoveries. And Edward Kelly, the occultist guy who created this whole thing as a hoax in order to sell it, in order to probably make a bit of money out of it. So for a third theory, some people believe that this was the work of a young Leonardo da Vinci. Um, there's not as much solid evidence for this theory, um, but it basically says that he was from a rich, well-to-do family, so he was able to afford uh, the parchment and the very expensive inks uh, to create this entire manuscript. Um, he was very smart and artistic as a kid, so he would have probably been able to, you know, come up with a make-believe language, draw some kind of fantasiful scenarios and plants, uh, that sort of thing. The kid had a wild imagination. Um, and some of the drawings in the manuscript are quite basic and almost childlike, and some of them are a little more advanced. Um, so that's one of the arguments that says it may have been, you know, a kid rather than an adult sort of thing. Uh, and one of the last parts of the theory is that one of the astrological drawings uh, lines up in some way to April 15th, if you kind of decode everything, um, which is da Vinci's birthday. Um, and there's not too much more on that theory, but it is kind of an interesting theory. So we got some of the main theories out of the way. Let's talk about encoding. Uh, so historically, when things used to be encoded, uh, they were done with various different methods. There's a basic one called the shift code, is you basically shift the letters 
that you're going to write out to uh, you know a certain amount to the right, a certain amount to the left, or whatever. So maybe if you were using shift code 4 or something, uh, for every A that you would write, you would instead write a D. And then for every B you would write, you would write an E instead. So this is a very easy uh, encoding method to use, but for the same reasons, it's very easy to decode it as well. Um, another method, similar method, is one called the circular cipher, or using a circular cipher. Um, this is a method in which you have essentially two circles of letters. You, you can probably have more. And it just allows you to more easily track kind of what letters you're translating uh, and, and allows you to perform encoding to a higher degree. So in our previous example, say instead of decoding at a flat rate or, or encoding at a flat rate of four every single time, um, maybe you turn the inner circle once for every new letter that you do. So maybe the first one is A to A, the next one might be plus one, so it might be B to C, and then you can do that as you go around. So it's not a one-to-one -one kind of translation anymore. When you come back around to A, it'll actually be a different letter that you're translating to. Um, so that's a small addition in terms of technique or technology, um, but you're making it a lot more complex. You can also have multiple circles and really get advanced with the, um, with the encoding on that. Another method was a code dictionary. So you can imagine in a regular dictionary, you would have a word that represents a meaning, right? Um, so in these coding dictionaries, you would essentially have a symbol that represented a word. So if we're talking about sensitive material back in the day, say about the king or the pope or something, you and I would pre-agree on a symbol to use for the king. Might be a little squiggly line, might be a little drawing, you know, could be anything. So anyone who doesn't know that symbol and what it represents, there's almost nothing to decode because there's no, there's no encoding, right? We just agree on a random symbol to represent the word king, uh, and that's what it is. Um, they might be able to decipher it with context in some way, but if the entire message is written out in this encoded way, then it would be very hard to decode it. The only problem is each side needs to agree that this is the set list of uh, encoded messages, uh, encoded words, before they, you know, even send the message, um, which obviously means you can't be that flexible with it. You can't talk about things that you hadn't predetermined that you would talk about. Uh, you can't add in words or, or that sort of thing. So it's very secure, but not very flexible. So one interesting method I saw for randomizing letters and symbols, uh, as well as encoding, is something called the Cardan Grill. So this is something that's normally used for encoding messages and decoding messages, obviously. Um, but it could also be used to generate symbols and words and letters randomly quite quickly. So how it's normally used to encode and decode messages, um, I will demonstrate for you in order to save half an hour of me explaining. Uh, so if I were sending you a message, uh, an encoded message, we would both beforehand have a card, have a card each, that are similar, oh sorry, identical, um, with holes in them. So it'd be something like this. So, um, you know, might be, a, might be a shorter card or a smaller card or what, whatever, but it would be a card with holes cut out of it in a seemingly random order and shape. Uh, so I would have one of these when I was making the message and you would have one of these also in order to decode the message. So I would use it to encode the message, send it off to you, you would receive something like this, a silly little, uh, you know, a poem with no, with no actual meaning to it. So when you'd receive the message, you would take the poem, you would take the card, you would lay them over each other, and what it would reveal would be a incredibly important, urgent message that only you could understand. 
So one way that this can be used to quickly randomize uh, letters or symbols or sentences or what have you is something which I won't fully go into here as it does require me cutting out these little squares again which took quite a while. Um, but what you would do is say you would take the first two holes here you have L and you have I. So those would be the first two letters of whatever word you're writing and these can be completely made up symbols. What you would normally do is have a large grid on here and each square in the grid would have a symbol, whatever symbol you want. Then you would have here, you can pick any any two of these, it's, it's literally completely random. So you pick these two, first two, um, it would be LI for that one. Then you would move the, uh, the sheet over to a, another random random place on the grid, maybe you uh, stagger them a little bit, and you would get S and E on here. And then you would, it's a little hard to line them up because it's not a, it's not an actual grid. Um, but as you see here, this one would be R and B. So you can fill up just one single grid with just completely random uh, letters and symbols, and then use the Cardan grill in order to really quickly go through them and get a randomized, uh, well-distributed um, set of letters in order to write them in the manuscript. However, with the advancement, as we have today, of modern computers and technology, they were able to evaluate all 170,000 characters in the manuscript. Um, so with technology, people are able to often take old languages, say hieroglyphics, and determine the meaning of the hieroglyphics through context, through comparing them to languages at the time. So for instance, in most languages, you will have some pattern of uh, verb usage, of nouns, of punctuation. They're definitely not the same for every language, but you will get a pattern amongst most of the main languages and even some of the rarer languages. But the patterns of the words and the sentences and the sentence structure in the Voynich manuscript does not match up with any language that we know currently or that we know historically at all. Um, even hieroglyphs, which are just symbols, um, which might be thought of as the thing we mentioned earlier, the code dictionary, even those are decipherable. Um, but this, the stuff in the Voynich manuscript, was completely uncrackable. There was no meaning to be taken out of the words or the sentences or anything like that. Which begs the question, what if there was actually nothing to crack or decode? Because to decode something assumes that it was encoded in the first place, right? You would take a certain amount of meaning, you would encode it, and what was left was meaningless until you reverse the process. What if the original meaning didn't exist? If there was no meaning in the actual text, then there was nothing to decode and there was no meaning to get out of it. Um, so there's quite a few people who believe that there is no actual cipher in the text of the Voynich manuscript. As all the evidence seems to point to it being not an encoded message, but something created to look like an encoded message, or to look like a language. Uh, in other words, a hoax. So where does that leave us? Personally, I think the theory of a crackpot scam artist, Edward Kelly, uh, seems to fit quite well. Everything seems to fit his MO in a way, uh, you know, coming up with symbols, coming up with uh, encoded languages, stuff that only he could understand. Forgery when he was younger, trying to convince rich, powerful people uh, of his supernatural abilities, you know, in order to make a quick buck sort of thing. Um, that seems to, for me, fit quite well into what the Voynich manuscript seems to be. Um, he was also traveling around Europe quite a bit. He was also quite close with John Dee, the guy who sold Rudolf the manuscript, uh, so it's quite a snug theory, except for one thing. Recently, scientists have carbon dated 
the Voynich manuscript to quite a high level of accuracy uh, and have estimated the creation of the manuscript to be somewhere around 1400 AD, which was 150 years before Edward Kelly was born. Um, it was also 50 years before Leonardo was born and 100 years after Bacon had died. So those are all my theories just out the window, which actually, funnily enough, is a word. It's a word I found out today called defenestration which is the act of throwing someone or something out of a window, which I found this out because the Bishop of San Severo actually threatened to do this to Edward Kelly during an interview because he was being such a dick. So, yeah. So from the fact that it was made around the 1400s um, and based on a specific drawing in the manuscript uh, of a castle, this castle had a type of battlements called a swallow-tailed battlement. Um, and these specific style of battlements were only built in Italy at around the time period that the manuscript was made. So that has helped maybe narrow down the origin or maybe where the author grew up or where they created it, um, that sort of thing. But aside from that, there's not too much more info that we've been able to gather from them. So this is kind of strange because some of the theories line up really well, others line up really well as well, but for other reasons, um, but none of them seem to fit 100%. Um, for instance, it could have been the works of Roger Bacon uh, that someone had found 100 years after his death or 50 years or whatever and then later recreated through transcripts into the Voynich manuscript, which would maybe explain the age of it. But then that completely goes against the theory that nothing in the book is encoded and it's all just nonsense. Um, I think the Edward Kelly theory fits really well, except for the fact that it's, you know, 150 years too late. So yeah, I'm kind of lost with this one, if I'm honest, guys. Uh, there's probably a lot more theories that are going to come out, maybe a bit more science. Um, but as of yet, we just don't know who made this, what it means, where it came from, what the intention or the inspiration was behind it. None of that. And if you want to check out the manuscript, there is a actual live copy of it in PDF form, which I have linked in the description below. So you can go down there, check it out go through it, try and figure out the mystery yourself. So that is all we have time for this week, guys. I really enjoy diving deeply into these mysterious topics. This is the first video on this channel uh, and I am completely open to covering a whole wide array of topics. So anything you guys think of that you'd like covered, just leave it down in the comments below or shoot me a message and um, I will do my best to, to, to dive into it. Um, so let me know in the comments below where you think this manuscript came from, what do you think it means, who the author of it was, who knows, maybe we'll figure it out through the power of the YouTube comment section. So I hope you enjoyed this little mystery of the Voynich manuscript, I suddenly did, and until next time guys, stay safe.